I recently had a conversation with an enthusiastic Christian believer. When I asked him to explain the gospel to me, he used many words to say, essentially, be nice to each other. And he didn't mention Jesus once. This was just the most recent example for me of what I've known for a long time, unfortunately, which is despite one of every three people on earth claiming the title Christian, the gospel is not very well understood at all. So this week on Something's Happening Here, we are preaching this gospel of the kingdom to all the world as a witness, starting with today's show called The World Shouts Its Evils and Condemns Its Goodness in These Last Days. I'm Steve Hicks, Director of Podcast Ministries for Talking Donkey International. Grab your Bibles and let's start the show. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Something's Happening Here. We have um, a bit of a format change, but I'm letting you know it, even though you may not otherwise know it. But we've done some changes in terms of how we structure the, the program on the back end. So uh, it may just feel a little bit different uh, as we go forward this week. And before we start, I want to acknowledge publicly and openly that Talking Donkey International suffered a loss recently. The president of our parent company has suffered a loss in his family. And so we want to remember him in our prayers. If you would join me right now to um, invite the Lord into the program and remember our friend who is suffering right now, Lord Jesus, it's always hard when somebody that we love passes away, and it reminds us how desperately we need you, Lord, because we live in a world of death. So I pray that you will comfort our friend and our the president of our company and comfort him and his heart in the loss that he's suffering right now and whisper into his aching ears the promises of the gospel and the promise of the resurrection, which is to come soon when Jesus Christ returns from heaven. And Lord God, for everybody who's listening and every one of us who are feeling the loss directly, I pray uh, the comfort of eternity. Remind us that this is not our home. And remind us continually throughout this program, throughout the week, because we all want to meet Jesus very, very soon. Amen. Okay. Um, it's tempting to just sit back and be sad for a little while. But the actual right answer is to keep preaching the gospel because the gospel of this kingdom must be preached. And that brings us to our first scripture of the day. If you can join me with your Bibles in Matthew chapter 24, please, that's going to set the stage for our program for today. Matthew 24, and we're going to start in verse 14. That's the exact scripture I was just referencing. Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. This is the only specific event that Jesus says, like, this will happen, and then the end will come. Everything else is just like, this will happen at some point before the end comes. This will happen as part of the end coming. But the spreading of the gospel is the one specific thing that Jesus says, do this and then the end will come, right? This has to happen first. And you notice in this little description he gives us in verse 14, it does. It says nothing at all about the audience receiving what they have heard, right? It's not all the world will accept the gospel and then the end will come. No, it's all the world will hear it. And then whether they accept it or not, that, that's up to Jesus. I mean, Jesus is the judge. He gets to do whatever he's going to do with that data. But my job and yours, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, is to preach the gospel of the kingdom and then leave the results up to the Lord. So that's what we're going to do today. And we're going to actually do it all week long on this episode, on this current episode. We're going to preach the gospel and specifically the, <laughs> the reason why, okay, yeah, the reason why we're going to the next scripture to kind of narrow down what we're going to do all week is because of what I mentioned in the opener that I had a conversation with a believer allegedly um, a couple of weeks back. And he was very excited to tell me all the ways that he found the Lord and how excited he was to have a relationship with the Lord. Um, and so I was just asking him questions. I wasn't trying to like browbeat him as the ordained pastor or anything. I just wanted to see where he was at. And I was asking him questions and I said, 
hey, preach the gospel to me, brother. Tell me what, what is the gospel message? And he actually struggled to figure out what to say. And when he finally found the words, it was all about like, well, you know, the Lord tells us to be nice to each other. And so we have to go and do unto others and all that stuff. Very earthly answer. Not that it was wrong. Jesus does say, in fact, to treat others in a way um, that we would like them to treat us, right? To be considerate of another person's internal experience like we hope they are considerate of ours. So that's not wrong, but it's not actually the gospel. Gospel means good news. The good news that Jesus brings us and every spiritual leader known to man through all time has brought some version of like, hey, be nice to each other. So th that's clearly not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is something else entirely. So if you would join me, please. In the book of Revelation. Revelation um, chapter 14. Now, if you're not familiar with Revelation 14, it contains three messages that claim to be from God um, right before Jesus returns. In fact, it's the final three messages from God to the whole world to prepare for the return of Jesus. And we're actually going to look at that first message all week long. Because it's a comp it's it's a complex message, has many facets, and so we want to take it apart. And what it tells us, we're going to start in verse six, which is the announcement of the actual message. We'll talk about the actual message starting Wednesday. But the announcement says, "I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people." saying with a loud voice, and then we'll get to the actual message starting Wednesday, like I said. Okay, but this is the everlasting gospel, and it goes to the entire world, just like Jesus said. So in other words, in Matthew, Jesus says, go preach the gospel to the whole world. And then in Revelation, this angel says, the entire, the everlasting gospel is being, being preached to the whole world. And then verse 7 tells us the specifics as to what that gospel message contains. So for today, we're going to start with kind of the general understanding of the gospel, the one that we don't actually need to go to Revelation to learn about. Uh, we can learn about it in other ways too, but that will be the foundation for the rest of our argument on Wednesday and on Friday. So what is this everlasting gospel? My friend from a couple of weeks ago had trouble verbalizing that, but luckily the Bible does not. So if you would please open, keep your Bibles open, but go back to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is, in my experience, the one of the two Corinthian books that is not talked about nearly as much as the first one. And when we're in 2 Corinthians, it's often chapter 5, which is where we're going today. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. This is kind of the entire gospel boiled down to one sentence. And it says, for he, meaning God, the father, for the father made him, meaning Jesus Christ, the father made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In other words, the gospel is a substitution. I show up in front of God and I have nothing to offer him. I, I show up and I say, here, Lord, here I am. I'm broken. I'm beaten down. I've made mistakes. I'm wounded. I'm scarred. Uh, I have, I have, every time I try to do good, the best I can do is good-ish, mingled with a whole bunch of evil. I've got nothing that is worthy of heaven, but here I am. And Jesus answers that by taking this broken gift that I give him, this broken gift of nothing and sin, and returning to me a perfect life of righteousness that is fit for heaven. Ha! Even when my day-to-day -day beyond that receipt of the gospel is still not worthy of heaven, I still make mistakes. And so do you, by the way. I'm just using the first person to illustrate. But we still make mistakes. We still fall into temptation and even sin sometimes. And I know there's a lot of you pious believers out there who pretend that's not true, but I've been this, in this game for too long to believe that, okay? Everybody I've ever met is a broken sinner. 
especially usually the ones who pretend that they're not. So that that substitution takes place. And even when I continue to live in a broken, imperfect way, I'm covered by the gospel. And when the father looks down at me, he doesn't see broken, stupid Steve. He sees perfect, righteous Jesus. And it's amazing because I still, I've been in, in the ministry game for, I have mercy, 14 years now, the formal ministry game, 14 years. And I was informally preaching the gospel, uh, like in my living room to my friends for two years before that. I've been in this game long enough. <laughs> and yet... I still have nothing good to give to God. Nothing worthy of heaven. I thank Jesus for this substitution that he's willing to take my brokenness and replace it with his perfection. So here's a little testimony for you. If you've been watching the program for any, you know, any you know, decent amount of time, you may already be aware that I was an eyewitness to the September 11th terrorist attacks in New York City in 2001. I was uh, living in an apartment that was about 500 feet or so from the at least the boundary of the World Trade Center complex. So I was close enough that if the buildings had not fallen straight down, but rather had fallen over, that I would not be here talking to you today. It would have crushed me to death. And, you know, as you can imagine, that was a highly traumatizing experience for me. It was the first time in my life I legitimately believed that I was about to die. And not just once, but two times in a single morning, two times, in fact, within an hour, only about 30 minutes apart from each other. Uh, so in the aftermath of that, it was like my entire world had just been turned upside down and shaken around like a snow globe, you know, <laughs> just completely shaken around and you got to wait for it all to settle down. And I did just about every single thing wrong after that for a year. Um, you know, the big things were like, I, I turned to drinking. I, um, I, I turned to drinking. I could give you more details, but this is not about that, right? But I turned to drinking too much and I kind of quit sleeping for a year, <laughs> which meant I skipped a whole lot of classes and would have flunked several of them, except that the professors knew what I had been through and, you know, had mercy to give me a low passing grade instead of a failing grade. But I also did more than that. I spent too much money. Um, I made. I was in film school, so I made a, a movie, and included in my tuition was a certain number of you know equipment and and supplies. But due to my just like inability to be present during that entire year, I missed all of that. I got nothing for free, and had to go out of my pocket to rent all the equipment I needed, and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going deeply into debt. And I'm emotionally unstable. And um, accordingly, you can imagine, I alienated all my friends. To this day, I have no friends from college, which is a shameful thing for me to admit. There are two, my roommates, um, two of my three roommates over my college experience. I still talk to once in a while over Facebook, but I haven't seen any of these people face to face. And it's got to be what, 15, 16, 17 years now. Um, and I hate that. Like, I wish that I still had these people in my life, but I understand why they didn't want to be part of my life after the way I behaved after September 11th. So even after I moved to California and started to put my life back together, um, you know, you get stuck in trauma. You get stuck there. You have to actually heal from trauma. You can't just run away from it. And I was running away. So I was stuck in it, stuck in it, stuck in it. And I carried it with me for years and years and years and years until what do you think broke me out of that? I'll give you two guesses. His name is Jesus. And many people call him Christ. Can you guess? That's right. Jesus, the gospel broke me out of it um, because I learned I learned for the first time, for the first time, seriously, even though I grew up in Christian churches and more than one denomination of Christian churches, somehow I was in my mid twenties before I heard the actual gospel where Jesus wanted to take away my brokenness and replace it with his perfection and his righteousness. And that was such music to my ears. Um, yeah, Ephesians two, eight and nine, which I'm sorry, uh, 
producer is not in my list of scriptures for today, but that passage revolutionized my life. Um, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is, and this not of yourself, it is a gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. My apologies if I got one or two words wrong in there. I'm doing it from memory. But that idea radically changed my life because I knew that I had nothing to offer God. I was, I was like this bag of traumas. I started receiving these horrible traumas when I was like nine years old and they just kept coming and kept coming. And the September 11th attacks were just kind of like the crescendo on top of that mountain of trauma that I was living with. And it's like, I just, I had nothing even to give the world, let alone the perfect God. But the Bible told me that didn't even matter because all the Lord wanted from me was me as broken and dirty and sinful as I was. He wanted me to show up and say, Lord, I need you. So I did. And nothing was ever the same after that. Hallelujah. The gospel is more than self-help. Even though you can spend lots of money and go to self-help programs or listen to a guru or whatever, right? Even, even the courts have like court mandated programs they put criminals into to modify their behavior going forward. There are these things. They're out there. Um, AA is such a program where you're going to overcome your addiction to alcohol or NA, you're going to overcome your addiction to whatever you're addicted to. Uh, okay, got it. Why then is Jesus the only actual source of the true gospel? And I'll tell you why. Open your Bibles again. Jeremiah chapter 23, please. I'm sorry, that was wrong. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23 is where I'm going. So Jeremiah is in the Old Testament. I imagine you know that. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. It says this. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. The Bible tells us evil is such a part of our nature that we can't get away from it. We can't change it any more than we can change the color of our skin or, or an animal can change the pattern of its, uh, its coat. It just can't be done. So you can kind of round off the edges. Like if I'm walking through life with an anger problem, I can go to anger management. I can go to you know some program or some other program. I can do cognitive behavioral therapy and all that stuff, right? I can kind of learn how to behave better. But you know what never actually changes? is the heart. The heart doesn't change. I can learn how to not lash out in anger, but until my heart actually is cured from the anger or whatever caused it to express itself in anger, then the only thing that will change is my behavior. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. You can't go to any sort of self-help program to get a substitute gospel. And let me, let me illustrate this a different way, okay? We're at a moment in time when our culture doesn't really shame us anymore about anything. And when I was growing up, it shamed us about a lot of stuff. Um, you would have never seen an overweight person on the cover of the Sports Illustrated swimsuit magazine when I was younger. But you do now because fat shaming doesn't exist anymore, right? Uh, Body positivity means I'm beautiful no matter what I look like, and so on and so on, right? We we don't shame poor people anymore. Um, we don't shame, um, you know, old people anymore. We don't kind of kick them to the curb anymore. And I'm not saying that we should. Uh, like, shame is kind of gross in and of itself. So I'm glad that we don't make people feel bad for who they are anymore the way that we kind of commonly did back in the 80s and early 90s. But nonetheless, shame serves a purpose. It helps us to know what is kind of good and what is not good. And the reason you never saw a, an obese person on the cover of Sports Illustrated is because the cover of Sports Illustrated was for the ideal. It's for the thing that everybody recognized was good for everybody to aim to also be good. And if you fell short of that, 
well, back in the 80s, you probably could get made fun of. And so I'm glad we don't do that anymore. But if you fell short of that standard, the idea was that it's the standard didn't change and you could still aim toward that standard. You could go, you know, get an exercise program or change your diet or something so that you could better live up to the standard or get closer to it. We just don't do that anymore. And we're at, we've, we've come so far around that corner that we actually shout the things that we used to stay quiet about. We've turned the shameful things in life into something to celebrate. And perhaps the most obvious, at least in my mind, example of this, and in my opinion, the grossest example of this would be the shout your abortion movement. And so that brings us to our article for today, which is just from Wikipedia. And really just in case you don't know what that is somehow, because you're living under a rock and you've never heard that phrase, shout your abortion. But there is a link to a Wikipedia article about this movement. Uh, you can click to it in the show notes and read all about it if that's what you want to do. Uh, it just quickly says from the top here, Shout Your Abortion is a pro-abortion social media campaign where people share their abortion experiences online without, quote, sadness, shame, or regret for the purpose of, quote, destigmatization, normalization, and putting an end to shame. Tens of thousands of people worldwide have shared their abortion experiences online using the hashtag Shout Your Abortion. And it goes on from there. Listen, I've... I've known people who have suffered from abortion. I've known women and men, um, women who have been the victims of that procedure and men who were the fathers of the babies who did not survive that procedure, right? And I've seen firsthand how devastating this is, again, for both men and women. And um, beyond that, I just think it's disgusting. And I'm not going to mince my words about this. I, this is one thing our society does is it uses like euphemisms to talk about difficult things in a kind of sanitized way. I don't want to sanitize this. I think it is, there's uh, no evil greater, certainly very few evils greater than abortion because, uh, do I even need to verbalize it? Do you know what happens in an abortion? There's actually several different methods of abortion, and I guess the what happens depends on what version you pick. Um, but in a kind of traditional surgical abortion, you go in there and you crush the baby to death inside of the mother's womb, and then you vacuum out its remains into a sink. That's That's just gross. That's horrifically evil. And I am of the opinion... That is something you should feel some shame about, even if you believe you had no choice, like you were a young kid and, and you were worried about the way your parents would respond, or you were raped and the pregnancy was a result of that or whatever, right? I mean, I, I'm not one who pretends that there's no circumstance under the sun where this is something that should be talked about or considered. I live in the real world. I know it's a complicated issue, but... Regardless of why, the reality is that abortion is still killing the child that was growing inside of you, and really in horrific ways. And I think you should not be proud of that. I think it was, probably was good when you had to keep that to yourself, when you had to recognize that was wrong and do better in the future to you know, avoid those situations or use better birth control or whatever, right? But that's not what we do anymore. It's not safe, legal, and rare anymore like we all pretended it was in the 1990s. Now we shout our abortions from the rooftops. I had an abortion. We've got Michelle Williams and the Oscars getting up and praising abortion. If I didn't kill my child, I wouldn't be up here receiving this plastic trophy. You know? And so we've just come all the way around the bend on this issue. And it's all because of the lack of gospel in our society. When you do something horrible, it, it causes a scar in your life. And you can argue with me all you want, but when you murder your own child in your womb, that's an awful thing. And try having children after you've had an abortion. 
and you and you love them and you look in their eyes you're like oh this is amazing i love you you're perfect except that would have been true also for that child that is not with you because of the abortion right it's supposed to hurt and it leaves a scar and when you're suffering under a scar like that you only have two choices you either give it away to jesus let him let him literally take it away so it's not your experience anymore he forgives it it's gone it's the bottom of the sea hallelujah or absent of that you have to justify having done it in the first place which is how we arrive at shout your abortion from the rooftops it was such a great experience for me you should do it too and that's how we've got here we would never be at a position to shout your abortion if our culture was still Christian enough to understand and practice the gospel. But we live in a post-Christian world now. So now we shout our abortions. In any case, as a result of all of this, not just to shout your abortion, but everything in its family, we have arrived at Isaiah 5.20. That'll be our last scripture for today. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, wherein God says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, why woe? Like, what, what happens to you as a result of this woe? I mean, sure, you're going to have difficulty in your life walking around pretending that evil is good and vice versa, but ultimately... The ultimate woe from which you can't escape is verse 24. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. That's hellfire. That's hellfire. That is the final destruction of the wicked. That's what Revelation 20 verse nine calls fire descending out of heaven from God and devouring them until they are no more, right? That's the final destruction of sin. I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want it to happen to me. Don't want it to happen to the people I love. I don't want it to happen to any woman who has undergone an abortion or any man who has consented to the woman undergoing the abortion or any other sin. I don't want that to happen to anybody. The answer is the gospel. And that is the only answer. It's the gospel. So let's you and I accept the gospel today, right now, not tomorrow. Don't go talk to your parents or your kids or your family about it. Do it right now. Talk to the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Leave all your baggage behind. Your September 11th terror uh, disasters, your abortion disasters, your... Um, criminal disasters, like whatever has gone wrong in your life, the Lord wants to take it away from you and give you healing instead. Don't delay, friends. The world is passing away. I believe Jesus is coming soon. And when he appears in the sky, it's too late to give him, uh, to give him all your brokenness. Today is the day for that. Let's pray, you and I, right now. If you have never prayed a prayer like this before, then pray my words. Father in heaven, I am a sinner. I have sinned. I've sinned against you and against myself. I'm sorry. And I can't live with this brokenness anymore. Please take it away, not because I deserve that gift, but because you have offered to do that. Please take it away and replace it with Jesus Christ. Give me the gift of the Holy Spirit. Make my life whole again. And teach me how to walk in your ways from this point forward. Forgive my sins, Lord, and save me. Save me from myself and save me from the destruction of the wicked. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And with that, friends, I'm going to say goodbye to you for today. But I invite you to mark your calendars and come back on Wednesday as we're going to continue to explore this gospel message that needs to go to the entire world before Jesus comes. I hope you have a great couple days, and I'll see you back here Wednesday. May God bless you until then. <laughs>